I'm from the aquatic physics group. I've been in the uh, University of Geneva as an assistant professor since 2014. And I put our, our aquatic physics Twitter handle there in case you are interested to follow us. Um, just to give you an idea of what the aquatic physics group does, we work on how things move around in, in water, basically. So methane, car uh, carbon dioxide, pollutants, nutrients, how the physics of the gas transfer between the atmosphere and the environment. Um, I just wanted to present my research group here because they were very helpful uh, preparing this talk uh, with me. So. Um, so we all know about the greenhouse gases, right? This is the three uh, most major, so carbon dioxide followed by methane and nitrous oxide in order of <coughs> concentration. Um, since the Industrial Revolution, these three greenhouse gases have been making dramatic increases in the environment. And uh, you can see there's been some anomalies as well. So this is methane since uh, 1985 uh, that's gone up and then it plateaued at the beginning of the 2000 and then starts to shoot off again. And nobody knows why this happens. So I wanted to illustrate that with the methane budget and the environment and the atmosphere, we still have a lot of uncertainty and that's what I'll talk about a little bit now. Just talking, uh, my talk will be mostly about methane uh, here, but uh, just to mention a few words. So the ocean is generally a sink for carbon dioxide, um, but it's almost always a source of methane, the ocean and inland waters. Um, and methane is important for two factors. One is it's in lower concentration, but it's 28 times more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. And the other problem confounding it is that Methane is very insoluble gas, so that means if you get enough production in the environment, it can tend to form bubbles, which will rise to the surface and vent methane directly to the atmosphere. Some headlines from the last year. Uh, bad news for the CO2, we hit 410, and I haven't seen the recent numbers uh, lately. Uh, and I just wanted to show, this is a nice plot from, uh, I believe it's NOAA, I think the, the source dropped off, sorry. Uh, and this shows generally where this, uh, the ocean acts as either a source or a sink of carbon dioxide. So the red indicate sources, so that's carbon dioxide coming out, and the blue, like the cool colors, represent areas where carbon dioxide is going into the ocean. So. As I mentioned with uh, methane, we've had a double in, the, double in the atmospheric concentration in the last 100 years. So surface waters, lakes, oceans, inland waters, they contribute about 30% of the natural emissions to the atmosphere. And as I mentioned, I already told you about the global warming. And as it's so low, low uh, with a low solubility in the high production, you get bubbles that form. And this is actually taken from sediment in a river in Germany. So you can see the methane gas bubbles escaping there. Um, in numbers, there was a nice paper from David Vasviken uh, that came out in 2011 where he did the, an assessment of the emissions just from inland waters. And so we can see here the concentration in blue and the red is just the rate of increase year to year. So we have an average increase in the atmosphere of about, let's say, 30 to 40 teragrams per year. But the total emissions just from inland freshwaters is 103 teragrams per year. So that could be quite a significant contribution to this. Half of these emissions are by bubbles here. So half is by just sediment coming into the water, um, methane coming from the sediment to the water to the atmosphere. The other half is from bubbles forming in the sediment that are released directly to the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide in the atmosphere itself has a residence time of many, many centuries. As I said, the sink is in the ocean. But methane has a residence time of only 12 years. So if you can identify places where we could potentially mitigate this outgassing, then we would see a response in a few decades in the atmospheric concentrations. So I want to get into a little bit more technical uh, points of how methane's formed. Um, I'll go quickly through this part, but there's the abiotic uh, methane formation, and a lot of these uh, processes are just becoming recognized in the last years, um, as you can see from the years on the citation. So abiotic, there's two, there's photodetic degrada degradation of organic matter, so just UV and sunlight uh, hitting um, organic matter, and then there's also photo degradation of dissolved organic carbon, especially UV light, uh, tends to produce it. 
The biotic processes, I think the uh, aero anaerobic uh, production of methane, so in the absence of oxygen, this is all well known to all of us, and I'm sure you've been swimming somewhere in a natural water and you step down and the little bubbles form around your feet, and this is the anaerobic uh, methane being produced in the sediment. And there's a new path that came to light where methane is produced by biological activity in aerobic environments, so in, in environments where there's oxygen. And this is very important because it uh, allows methane to be formed throughout the whole water column. So where does it come from? So we have uh, organic matter coming in rivers from the surrounding landscape, and we have algae being produced when phosphorus and nitrogen come in. So these algae and this stuff goes to the bottom and it decays. And as it decays, it needs certain electron acceptors. And it works down this cascade in order of uh, energy. So the, the most energetic is using the oxygen to reduce the organic matter and it produces CO2. And it moves on down the line to sulfate where you get hydrogen sulfide, the smelly rotten egg. And then the terminal process is the production of methane here. So of these gases, I just plotted here relative solubility of the gases based on standardizing it to nitrogen. So nitrogen is the least solu most soluble gas of, of these listed. And then we have oxygen and methane are right along with it. But hydrogen sulfide and CO2 are very soluble in comparison. So CO2 is about 50 times more soluble than nitrogen, about 25 more than methane and hydrogen sulfide is about 70 times more than methane. So these, these stay in the water, they don't form bubbles and escape. So what happens? We get too much of this algae going to the sediment, the oxygen goes away, it gets broken down, and it starts to produce methane, and sometimes it produces at very fast rates, and you start to see these bubbles. And this is from a lake in Switzerland that we're working on, Lake Halville, and this was a seismic uh, survey that we did of the bottom of the lake, and you can see these reflections here. These are all gas bubbles in the sediment. So the gas bubbles actually absorb the energy from the acoustics, so you can't see anything below. So once we move down a little bit deeper into the lake, then we see we can start seeing the structure of the sediment below, and this is where the gas front ends. So the bubbles form when the gas pressure in the sediment exceeds the local pressure. Here's an example of uh, two lakes, and um, these are actually two lakes next to each other in Germany. One is very eutrophic, so it has a lot of algal, algal growth, a lot of uh, nutrients. One is oligotrophic, so it's very clean, uh, clear water, very low, and you can see the difference in the methane. So this is in the water column from the surface to the sediment, and then in the sediment we have a dramatic increase in the methane uh, concentrations. So this methane in the sediment that's produced will come out from diffusion into the water and potentially here forming bubbles as well. And you can see this very dramatically in some frozen lakes. Uh, this picture has made quite a lot of rounds from uh, Abraham Lake in Canada where the lake froze and as it froze, escaping bubbles from the bottom rose and are trapped into the ice. And then some crazy scientists come along and poke a hole in them and light them on fire and you, know, you see what happens. So don't, don't try that at home. I guess in Singapore you can't do that. <laughs> so that's kind of the conventional uh, anaerobic production of methane. And this is another lake in Switzerland, uh, Lake Sopen. And you can see what it looks like here, that it has so much algal production that it uses all the oxygen goes away in the bottom and we start to see the methane increasing uh, as we go deeper and deeper to very high levels. So methane has been measured in lakes for a long time. And Lake Halville, I showed you an example before, they've been monitoring methane in there for the last 40 years. But methane supposedly didn't occur in oxic environments, so they only measured from 20 meters or 15 meters and below. So what happened in 2015, we went out there and had a look and measured the methane through the whole water column. And we were very surprised to find, this is the surface down to 45 meters. We were very surprised to find a pretty substantial increase of methane towards the surface waters. And this is uh, the time evolution of the methane uh, from about uh, May to October. So you can see about five to 10 meters, there's high levels and even in the surface water. 
So we did a mass balance and we said, how much methane is this? And it actually turns out to be quite a lot that comes out because it's right at the surface. So it turned out to be 80 kilograms per day. And actually we were uh, very uh, uh, fortunate that we got this paper published in Nature Communications just about four or five months ago um, there. But it's a very highly controversial topic. There's nobody really knows where this methane is coming from. Um, there's several hypotheses. Um, photo degradation of stuff in the surface water, as I mentioned before. Uh, local anoxic environments in the surface water, like if you have a bunch of stuff that's stuck together, then maybe in the middle it becomes anoxic. Um, some sort of consortium of archaea and algae. I'm a physicist, don't ask me too much about the biology, please. <laughs> um, when the bacteria become phosphorus starved, apparently they undergo a different process where they can cleave and uh, they can cleave uh, molecules and form methylated compounds which can uh, be broken down into methane. And the other thing that's very important is also the methane oxidizers, the guys who eat the methane and turn it back to CO2 they're inhibited by light as well. So when the methane occurs in the surface water, there's nothing there to oxidize it, which allows it just to vent into the atmosphere. <coughs> this also occurs in the ocean. And we did a literature review, uh, uh, my colleagues and I, in uh, last year, two years ago, where we kind of compiled all the data that had been reported in the oceans and the lakes. And I just wanted to highlight some of the ones from the oceans here. So, as I said before, and I'll mention again, the methane budget is very uncertain, and some of these new sources are just coming into light in the last years. Um, a lot of these uh, discussions are very controversial, and, uh, but I highlight that the sources are very still uncertain, and so we have to go and measure them and figure out where the methane is actually coming from. So that brings me to fluor de Um so winds of change, the checking the greenhouse gases in the footsteps of Magellan. Uh, when I was just a new professor in University of G Geneva, Samuel and his colleagues came to visit me and told me about their very exciting project. I said, do you have any ideas? And then, you know, the light bulb immediately went off in my head. I said, yes. <laughs> and it's been a couple of years, but we finally got, uh, got the program uh, rolling. And I'll give you, show you a little bit of the preliminary results that uh, we um, we just actually uh, plotted yesterday, uh, downloaded and plotted yesterday, and uh, speculate a little bit of a, about what we can see there. So it took us a while to get the funding and everything rolling to get the project started. So we started it in, um, in uh, the Philippines, in Cebu. It's not on the map. Uh, in December of last year. So we've had it on, had it on board uh, of almost three months now. And how we, what we want to do is we want to look for these hot spots. So I said that there's methane coming from bubbles, right? And there's methane coming from the sediment. And then there's also potentially this other source. So what makes this possible is this new greenhouse gas analyzer. This is from a specific company uh, called Los Gatos Research out of California. And I think these became available commercially about seven or eight years ago. And they're in a little suitcase. They weigh about 15 kilograms. They don't use much power, so they can be installed easily in airplanes. Uh, some guys uh, in the US drove across the US with one mounted in the side of their car and measured all the greenhouse gases. So we're doing similar stuff, but on the boat. And uh, before that, it wasn't possible. Either you had to take air samples and run them on gas chromatographs or use huge uh, instruments on board uh, that were pr pretty prohibitive. So what we're looking for is we're looking for data to see where high concentrations of methane are and high concentrations of CO2 and identify areas where the ocean is a CO2 source or sink. So when the ocean water is oversaturated in these gases, then it obviously wants to come out to the atmosphere. And the rate at which it comes out depends on the difference in concentration between what's there and what's at equilibrium and the wind forcing. Oh, that's just a little bit of a recap. So we started the project in 20th uh, December, and now uh, today is the 14th, I think, right? So what did the data look like so far? 
So this is a little bit complicated graph, but I think it's a nice way to see where the ship has been and see the concentrations of the different gases. So here we have longitude, latitude. This is where we started in Cebu, Philippines. And uh, this is the concentration of methane and PPM. Same with the CO2. So atmospheric average background concentrations of methane are about 1.6 ppm here. And average background, as I showed you before, of CO2 is about 410. So we started in Cebu, and we moved along. And in Cebu City, we can see very high peaks. And then they went around the islands and uh, up towards Kuching. And then uh, yesterday, we arrived in Singapore. So we can plot this in a, just a, a more simple 2D graph here. And we can kind of see easily identifiable hot spots of high uh, concentrations of methane. So again, background is somewhere, you can almost see the baseline here. Um, so in Cebu City, uh, the boat was quite some time there. It was sailing around the islands and coming back. And so you can see it's very high, uh, six, seven times above atmospheric um, background concentrations. And then in the open ocean, in the deep water, it was really at background levels. But then when they approached these more shallow island areas here, we started to see about a 50 to 60% increase in the methane concentration. And then we get towards uh, Kuching in the river there. It was much higher. And then we uh, came into, of course, Singapore there. And that's uh, two nights ago now. Uh, and um, I'll show that in a little bit more detail. So the carbon dioxide, the picture looks pretty much the same. You have kind of in the same areas where you have high um, methane production, you have also high carbon dioxide. And that's because, as I said, the first step of the degradation of organic matter is to use the oxygen to produce CO2. So these areas that have high methane probably have a lot of organic matter in the water in general. So we kind of, kind of see similar trends uh, as well. Um, so then I have just a screenshot of uh, when we were coming in. And uh, so this is when we were approaching uh, Singapore Strait here. This is 24 hours. This is the methane concentration from 1.8 to 2. So we're out in the open ocean. And we're approaching Singapore Strait. And anybody can guess where we, when we hit Singapore Strait. <laughs> you can see right here it was when we hit Singapore Strait. And, uh, so we had some peaks that went up to about 2.1 and then kind of trailed off as we approached the harbor. And actually, this is when we anchored there. Um, I had several people approach me this morning and ask me about the strait and this harbor area where we're in. They expect very high methane. And I did actually, too. And I would say this is not particularly high from what we've seen from other harbors. And we were speculating a little bit of why this might be. So I guess there's no agriculture in Singapore, as far as I know. Um, and that's probably would be a big cause of the increase that we see in the other, um, in the other harbors. So you have um, uh, misuse of uh, nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, animal waste, um, improper disposal of other organic waste that can make their ways down to these harbor areas. Hello, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and the other thing is uh, Singapore is obviously very proactive in their environmental standards. So I think there's more advanced uh, treatment here of wastewater, uh, more better handling of solid waste and things like that, the stuff that would fuel this methane growth. In, in the so that's the preliminary results. It's uh, fantastic so far. We, we look forward to getting more into the data. Um, I'll just I'll give you an overview of the, the overall goals of the project. And, I think Samuel touched on this a little bit. Uh, one of them, social, of course, uh, raise awareness, education. Uh, we're in the process of getting web updates uh, going that you can see in more real time, the data. Classroom course visits, exactly what we're doing here today. Um, press releases and interaction, that's a very important part. And the science side, we have several goals as well. Uh, these data will be made publicly available in a database, and they can be used to this is a satellite image of methane concentrations over the whole globe from, uh, again, NOAA. I don't know what happened to my site. Uh, so these data can be used to compare with satellite readings as a calibration technique. We can use them to identify hot spots of methane that maybe we should look a little bit closer in these areas if we want to mitigate. 
Um, and more importantly, or also very important, is that they'll be used to update the uh, IPCC uh, atmospheric uh, calculation budgets. Um, uh, we hope that once we start getting more data from very different water types, we can see some kind of correlation between the water type, the land use in the surrounding area, the population, and, and develop sort of a, a way to say a priori, we look at this region, we can expect maybe this amount, and this could be a very useful technique uh, to do that. As far as I know, um, there's not been a similar project to measure at least methane, especially along these coastal regions and in these harbors and stuff. So, um, so we now we'll collect data. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention that I didn't write here is this uh, this project here is a, it's an important. A prototype to show the feasibility and we hope that it will expand and encourage other institutions, research, private people to invest in this equipment, put it on their boats and even increase the data set even more. It's very, it's relatively inexpensive from scientific equipment wise. It's about 40,000 US dollars uh, for the instrument. <laughs> it's one of my, one of the cheaper ones, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> So we will, uh, we will uh, fortunately get data all the way through uh, around the coast of South Africa, back up to Europe, and I very much look forward to seeing that. So I want to conclude uh, and give you guys some nightmares tonight, uh, if I can, since it's late. <laughs> I have a very interesting colleague at MIT. I met him a few years ago, and he made the big headlines. Uh, a few months ago, I don't know if you guys follow Science Alert in the news, but he had this MIT professor predicts Earth's next mass extinction in the end of 2000, uh, 2100. And actually, he has very compelling arguments because the methane is, or the CO2, carbon dioxide, is as high as it's been in a million years now. And uh, every mass extinction that he went back and looked at, there was such a carbon excursion, a CO2 excursion as well. So. In that terms, he, he raises some pretty good points. Of course, the, the press maybe took some liberties there. <laughs> the same professor also, he looked at the methane back in uh, extinctions. And I don't know, uh, oh, thresholds, yep, that's, uh, that's the paper there. So the end Permian extinction was an extinction that happened 250 million years ago. And it was the biggest extinction ever on the planet, wiped out nearly 99% of all life on the planet, almost killed the planet. And he came out also with a funny paper, too, that he said that what happened was during the carbonaceous period, the plants got more complex and began producing lignin and cellulose and stuff like that, and the bacteria were behind them that couldn't break it down. So it kind of built up a supply, which is maybe why we have so much coal from that time as well. So his idea was there is the methane, um, methanosarcina, that all of a sudden had a lateral gene transport and then it had, could use this acetate. And so it just took over super exponentially and turned all this acetate into methane, which vented into the atmosphere, destroyed the health of the oceans, uh, caused climate change, rapid climate change. And you can see very dramatic shifts in the isotope signatures during that time. So. Something to think about. <laughs> so anyways, I want to conclude there. And I want to say, again, a very special thank you to uh, the Foundation, uh, Foundation uh, Pacific and the crew of the Florida Passion, which without this would not be possible. Of course, my team, Sabina Fleury at EPFL in Lausanne, who helped a lot with the slides as well. Of course, our funding agencies. And of course, uh, James Cook University for the opportunity to be here.